On this episode of SF Factual, we'll continue with basic land navigation and today's topic, topographical maps. Let's do this. Hey YouTube, this is SF Actual. Today we'll continue with our training in basic land navigation and the topic today is topographical maps. Um, this is the US military, US Army uh, PowerPoint presentation that they briefed to soldiers and we'll just go ahead and get started. Understand that a map is a graphic representation of the Earth's surface drawn to scale. Uh, it's basically to mean that even though you've never been to this particular place, even though you've never talked to anyone that's been there, you can already know quite a bit about a map. Um, um, based on so many different things that are on it uh, minus just looking at it and kind of understanding direction there's colors there's lines there's symbols there's labels things that you can pull from now a topographical map uh, is governed by multiple authorities that have come together to create a standard that if you ever do acquire one of those from that authority you're gonna it's all gonna be the same it's all gonna be standardized so in this case here uh, brown contour lines. So contour lines is showing elevation. Uh, we'll go over that in a little bit in detail. Uh, black is man-made features, roads or trails. Blue is water. Green is vegetation. Red is highway and land grids. And sometimes you'll have two minor colors for pink for build-up areas, uh, which will normally kind of be a blob of showing this is a built-up area. And then purple, updated map information. That could be land clearing that they've done, um, you know, planting trees that might start having vegetation, different things that they need to make known because sometimes they will go back out and create updates to this. Um, the symbols are used for natural and man-made. Uh, lines show relief and elevation. Every map has a margin information above the map which we're about to get into and they come in three sizes, small, medium, and large. But the key thing to remember here is a map is read for four basic kinds of information. Direction, distance, position, and identification. Um, and before we move on, I just want to iterate on the thing that I spoke on about the compass is when you are conducting land navigation, you want to have the, the best tools, the best um, equipment that you can have, but you also want to understand your equipment. You want to know how to use that compass. You want to know how to use that map. You want to be reserved and have good composure when conducting land. And what I mean by that is... Uh, Mistakes will expound on each other when you conduct land navigation. I cannot push that hard enough that if you do not have a good pace count and you come up short and you shoot a new azimuth and start heading in another direction, um, you're going to start getting lost and have to backtrack completely unless you can self-correct yourself at that point. Um, reading the wrong azimuth can take you in the wrong direction. There's so many different things uh, that if you continuously make mistakes in land nav and you don't learn how to master them now and conduct it um, adequately, it can, it can get you lost and then it can turn into a survival situation and then uh, you're in a really bad uh, point. So going over map margin information, a map could be compared to any piece of equipment is that before it's placed into the operation, the user must read the instructions. It's important to know how to read these instructions, which we're about to do in the next few slides. Most logical place <clears throat> is to begin in the marginal information of, and symbols. Uh, all maps are not the same, so become, it becomes necessary every time a different map is used to examine all of the marginal information. So the top left corner of all USGS topographical maps uh, carry the imprint of the authority responsible for the map in this case, it's the United States Department of Interior Geological Survey. That's in the top left. Top upper right 
is you're going to have the quadrangle name. The state is normally also given, and it may include the county. Uh, also includes areas covered by the type of map. So in this case, you're looking at Colorado um, at this boggy draw. And uh, there's a little bit of information here on a 7.5 minute series topographical map. Uh, now moving over to the bottom right, this is where you get into um, all road classifications, what a primary is going to look like, a light duty, a secondary, unimproved. You can see here on a map that it's going to be either solid red or dash line. It also will have symbols for interstate route, U.S. route, state route, um, like that. And then it will also give you the quadrangle location shown as a black square superimposed on a state map. So what is happening here, if you look in this portion, is the state of Colorado, and this black dot is pretty much where that map is in reference to the state. That's what quadrangle means. It's showing if you were trying to see where you're at in the state, this is pretty much where you're at in the state. Again, just more information. Moving over to the middle is where you'll get into the map scale ratio. In this case, it's a 1 and 24 thousandths uh, square map, um, um, scale map. Uh, distance bars, how far a mile is, how far a kilometer is, and then it breaks down into uh, portions of that. Um, and then, forgive me for this being covered up, but the contour interval. So this is very important. The contour interval is 20 feet. So, again, I mentioned brown lines or contour lines. So from here on this line to this next line is either an elevation up or a um, D elevation down of 20 feet. Right in there is a distance between 20 feet. You can see on these same amount of lines from this distance is 20 feet. So that means that is a very gradual change right there. We're going to get into that real hot and heavy in just a minute, but just kind of breaking that down for you real quick. Moving over to the lower left um, is going to be the credit legend, complex of information, and a definite key thing to remember here is the magnetic declination. This is very important. Uh, you have to locate this on the map before you start doing any kind of planning or conducting land navigation. So when we were in the compass episode, I talked about true north, magnetic north, and grid north. Here in this case, the star, and this is a standard thing across the board, mostly all true north will have a star, um, is showing this is true north. This line right here takes you to the North Pole. This is true north directly to the North Pole. Now magnetic north is how your compass is going to behave when you are in this area. So when you are standing on this map in Colorado, your compass is going to be 11 and a half degrees off of true north. And then you also have Grid North, which is ran by the Universal Transverse Mercator, the UTM grid. Now, just so you can understand this, on this map, it looks like those grid lines are running parallel, which on this map they pretty much are. But if you continued map after map after map after map and moved up towards the North Pole, all these lines are starting to converge right onto the North Pole. They're not running parallel. So we can't just have these running parallel into the universe. They're all trying to be driven off of um, True North, which is the North Pole. So there is going to be declination also of the grid north itself. And I'm going to show you as we dig in here of how to take a topographical map, identify the declination of where your magnetic north falls, where your grid north falls, and how to either add or subtract when you are trying to put a azimuth down on the map or you're trying to draw an azimuth from the map to give to yourself for a compass that you can get a direction that you're wanting to walk. Uh, real quick over here, additional information. Um, the, so the number ones, you can see the number ones, they're on these corners and they're normally written in a diagonal uh, fashion, is the names for the adjoining quadrangular maps in black, adjacent to the corners and centers of the map. So if you were trying to find the map that joins here in the corner, you would look up this one right here. Uh, this Dolores West, uh, 4258 Northeast. Um, and that's going to point that out. The number two, so all the twos right here in red are the distances by road to the nearest town. So there's a town down below here at the edge of this map that is two miles south uh, of, on Dorlays or however you say that. 
Uh, number three, the sphere, um, spherical grid, the latitude and longitude complete coordinates are given at each corner of the map. So here at this point, you are getting the lat long um, of this corner and you would have that on all the other corners. And then number four uh, is the UTM grid. Okay, and I know that's being covered up, but we're going to get over that in just a second. But this is actually the UTM grid um, that is showing boundaries, uh, and we'll jump into that in just a little bit. So map scale, uh, we'll go over this real quick. Uh, I'm not going to jump in it too heavy. Map scale is relationship between distance on the map and corresponding distance on the ground. Scale is represented by ratio, such as the map we were just looking at, one in 24 thousandths. Um, <clears throat> they're marked by feet, miles, meters, and kilometers. Maps will also show a scale, for example, of a 7.5 minute maps, often called large scale maps because they show more detail but cover less area. Uh, than a large bar scale, which would be like a 30 by 60 minute map. You must know that the scale to determine ground distance between objects and locations um, before you can ever plan what the distance is that you might be walking. The term small scale, medium scale, large scale may be confusing, uh, confusing when reading in conjunction with a number. However, if the number is viewed as a fraction, it quickly becomes apparent that a 1 in 600 thousandths of something is smaller than a 1 of 75 thousandths of something. Therefore, the larger the number after the 1, the smaller the scale of the map. Smalls, okay, so smalls, they're going to be scales from anywhere from 1 to 1 million and smaller. They're used for general planning and strategic studies. The standard small scale map, uh, small scale map, is one in one million. So that's one inch every 16 miles. So if you looked at it, a map uh, at a one in one million, every one inch is 16 miles. Mediums, so medium maps with uh, with scales larger than one to one million, but smaller than one to 75. Again, I know this is a lot of numbers. Just just understand what the ratios are, and we're just going to read through this real quick. They contain a moderate amount of details, uh, but terrain analysis is best done with large scale maps. The standard medium map is one in 250 thousandths, so here every one inch is four miles. Uh, so you're a little bit closer um, than the one in 16. Now on large scale maps, one in 75 thousandths and larger are used uh, for tactical, administration, administrative, and logistical planning. These are maps that you as a soldier or junior leader are most likely to encounter. Uh, one in 50 thousandths, that is the one that the U.S. military uses. Um, that's what I'll be teaching you on. Um, but once you learn one, you can do all the rest of them. Uh, but many areas have been mapped to a one in 25. So that means every one inch is only 2,000 feet. So large scale maps is what we're wanting to work with. Uh, I know that seems backwards, but it just means that you're getting way more information on a map. Uh, it's just not as much area. Just think about how far we can walk. Um, not a whole, you know, we can't walk uh, as far as a car or a plane. So we're wanting to use these large scale maps. So here in this case, you can see a medium scale at one in 150 thousandths. Um, the red box is the same that you're getting on this large scale topographical map at one in 24. So imagine trying to land navigate from this hilltop to this hilltop and measure what the distance is versus being able to come here, see this road, understand this hilltop, actually realize that there are contour lines. So there's either, um, you know, higher peaks and stuff, two peaks that you would be able to see uh, by terrain association and then be able to realize, uh, you know, this is a whole nother peak here, just way more detail. You'd be able to see the different buildings. See all these are different buildings here. You'd be able to see the waterway, even though you can see the waterway here, it's just way more detail. All these contour lines that you can see, again, lots of detail. I feel like I've beaten that up enough. I think you guys get it. Uh, here's another example. So small scale at one and hundred million. Real big area, not much detail. Then they're breaking it down to medium out of that full area and then jumping you down to a large scale of one and 24 thousandths much detail so from this little area of watching this road that's going through in these waterways you can see here the different contour lines of elevation changes these are the types of maps that we want to use for land navigation all right so real quick over maps and symbols um 
It is a maps language that is simple to read and understand, but you first must know the map symbols to represent in order to understand and read and speak a maps language. Some of these you can probably already tell right off the bat. That looks like swamp. That looks like vegetation. You remember the colors we were talking about. Um, you know, uh, more vegetation here actually sometimes they'll write in mangroves you know that that's a road um, so here on woods you can see this is normally going to be fully green um, showing a lot of vegetation a lot of growth uh, tree type stuff um, this right here will show shrubs where there is vegetation but it's not going to be trees and different things orchards you can see how this is more um, uh, in a row with each other. Um, there's there's or, uh, organizational here. That means that that's orchards. Uh, vineyards, again, orientation here, uh, organization, but a little bit tighter for vineyards. And then mangroves, uh, that blue representing water and stuff. Um, marsh and swamp, like we discussed. Uh, submerged marsh and swamp, a lot of blue that you know you can tell the differences here. There might be a good bit of land that you can walk on here, but not necessarily in this case. You're probably going to be getting wet. Wood marsh or swamp, uh, you can see here it's got trees, uh, submerged woods and swamps. And this stuff is also going to indicate you know types of threats that could be out there uh, crocodiles, snakes, different kind of stuff. Um, not just you know how easy is it going to be to walk or navigate it. Uh, rice fields and land subject uh, to inundation um, you know things getting flooded out and stuff uh, <clears throat> rivers lakes and canals so if you ever see these dots with lines that's showing it's an intermittent stream um, this one right here is going to be a heavier stream but again it's a stream you got intermittent river with this one uh, this one's more of a heavy river that's going to be constant small falls small rapids uh, large falls and rapids um, perennial uh, lake and pond uh, intermittent lake and pond dry lake uh, a well or a spring is driven by this right here a dam this is probably one that you didn't know but that that's showing a dam hitting to a big body of water and then a canal and then man-made features built up areas buildings will normally be indicated by just little blocks uh, school has a flag uh, church has the cross airports normally you'll see them like this but sometimes you'll see them blacked out if they're very very small landing strips cemeteries a mine a gravel pit um, highways roads dirt roads um, bridges so that's something to be key on a footbridge that's something to be key on if you're trying to cross a big body of water trail power lines you know power lines might be able to take you to civilization if you're lost that's something you'd want to look at a map that if you could find those you could easily get to land navigation and then land grids this is something else being able to see and we'll get into the um, military grid reference system that is MGRS uh, that is what we use for land navigation uh, but that is kind of breaking this down of land grids of the um, of the how the map works but we'll get to that in a minute contour lines contour lines let's go over this so contour lines is the distance between each other contour line and they are found along the bottom edge and center of the map where you see in the example it was 20 feet on that map we were looking at uh, intermediate contour lines are a brown line on topographical map and represent a line of equal elevation so we'll go over that in a second an index a bolder wider line that has an elevation value marked at various intervals as part of a line so easiest way to understand this is when you look at a topographical map you're going to see a lot of brown lines some are going to be fatter and bigger and they're going to have an index a starting point to say this is 700 feet or this is 800 feet um, that will come in handy sometimes when you're trying to get an idea of okay I'm I know I'm at 300 feet elevation here I need to get up to 800 feet uh, and it's just being able to tell you that but every line in between here uh, is another 20 so in this case a is 700 then we have this one right here which would be a, an additional 20 an additional 20 so 740 C being additional um, and then uh, what they're doing here for C what they're trying to show you is they're actually in between so you would have 720 740 760 
add an additional 10 feet, so 770, and then you would have the 780, the 800, and then line D is going to be 820. Hopefully that makes sense. It should be able to make sense. Now, contour lines can tell you so much um, about uh, terrain association. So there's two different things when you do land nav. There is dead reckoning. And there's land, um, I'm sorry, terrain association. So dead reckoning is when you take a compass and you shoot an azimuth and you are going to walk that azimuth at a certain distance. It might be 800 meters, it might be just 20 meters, whatever. That is dead reckoning. You are not going to want to do that when you are doing things over 100 meters or so. You're going to want to terrain associate. You're going to want to be able to look at a map and identify peaks and valleys and draws and uh, and we'll go over what all those are saddles ridges different stuff like that and be able to just look and walk the terrain and identify i'm walking past this peak i'm walking past this mountain i'm walking past this waterway um, that is terrain association and just so you can learn real quick what a contour line looks like so we'll look right here this is showing elevation changes, right? Contour lines, elevation changes. And you can see when it gets to this, um, this peak right here. So the way we know this is a peak, and this is something I should have brought up and I apologize, is the index line. So the index line is also going to show you which way the elevation is going. Because if these numbers were not here, you would not know if this is going up or this is going down unless you could identify like a water source um, over here and you could see that it's trailing up or a water source on this side and that it's trailing up. You don't know which way is up or down. Um, but most of the time when you are looking at a map and you see these tight circles that start touching each other, I mean, there's just a circle, that is normally a peak of a mountain or a hill. So you can see here we have a very gradual, see how stretched out these lines are from touching each other. That means 20 feet right in between here, but then a long 20 feet just to get up to elevation here. And then it, a real quick 20 feet up, so that means that's a quicker elevation up, that's a higher elevation up at a less distance and then all of a sudden it, it peaks out that is this portion right here you can see it's it's kind of a steep incline you would walk you'd have a real gradual walk up and then you, all of a sudden you would have this peak right here now this line that is surrounding the two peaks this this is called a saddle and we'll go over that in just a little bit you can see that it drops down and then it starts going back up and then you can see all these contour lines that lead up to this in this case, it's just pretty much a mountain. It's contour lines all the way up to a peak. Now, if just real quick, if I was, if I had to climb this, if this was a point I was trying to get a radio signal or be able to look around to see and get my bearings, if I can see a you know a building or a house or a city and stuff, I'm going to look at contour lines of how to do this. I would not want to climb up this southwest face right here because you can see how tight the lines are. These lines are so tight that that means that is 20 feet uh, incline every line so I'd be climbing straight up this mountain where if I walked over here I could have a real gradual walk up the mountain to get to that peak uh, here again are two peaks with a saddle in the middle we'll go over that uh, again this this is a good ex uh, good example you would not want to be climbing this side you'd want to be climbing this side but you can see peak stepping down so peak real steep edge real gradual this one's kind of flipped now you can tell that this is kind of a plateau that's why this peak circle is so big and then you can see how steep these are based on that hopefully this is making sense to you um, there's a dimension to establishing position which does depend on the map reading skills um, this is vertical dimension on a map it is referred to as relief Knowledge of the relief of an area is extremely important in a wilderness navigator. The most graphic techniques um, is devised here uh, to show relief is the contour lines. Um, if you ever walk a contour line, you could never go downhill or uphill, and eventually you would travel back where you started. So that, that that's a good breakdown. If you were wanting to walk around this mountain, if you stayed on a contour line, you would walk all the way around it at the exact same elevation and back where you started from. 
Now, terrain relief features. We were talking about relief is elevation. The, this is what's key. The, where I was talking about saddle and ridge and hill and stuff, we're about to get into that heavy of understanding that. So, uh, Army, we're all uh, kind of dumb when we first enter the Army, so they want to break it and dumb it down to us. Um, so here, they like to take the hand and show an example of where how you can memorize all of the relief features. So in this case is ridge. So a ridge would be something that you can see in the bottom where there are going to be different peaks of a mountain or hilltops, but there, there's just this this high point where everything left to right of you are, are quick drops or quick um, changes in relief. But there's a, a real um, almost straight or uh, not changing much in elevation of uh, between the two peaks, and that's called a ridge line. So in this case, here what they're showing on the map, and they're trying to indicate that if you can remember your knuckle, right, your knuckle and uh, that being a ridge. The next one is a hill, right? And we described what a hill was, that that's going to be contour lines coming all the way point uh, to the point of getting smaller and smaller where they show a hill. Um, another thing is a saddle. So they're actually going in between the finger here of a saddle. So on a ridge, a ridge connecting two mountains, you're going to have the saddle. That's going to be the drop part. And just think of a horse saddle, how it kind of holds you when you're sitting. That's a saddle. That is um, that is a feature that is in between two mountains, and you can see here. So if you were having to cross this, I would not want to walk up this peak just to do it. I'd want to come over here and hug this saddle and walk through it, and I'm not going to have to walk as much elevation because you're going to get more tired, and it's going to be more difficult. Now a valley. So here they're representing uh, the palm being open, if that helps you. Uh, but they're showing a valley where it's a breakdown. So here you can see all these contour lines and where they're all coming down into this area, but none of it is peaking, none of it is getting circular, right? It's all coming down, and another thing that's an indicator is this water. Remember, we're talking about intermittent streams and uh, at the waterway here, that you can see all of this is converging into this valley. And then you have your contour line. So if we did have to cross this valley, again, these are, these are steep contour lines because of how close they are. I would want to maneuver over here and try to cross somewhere in here where these contour lines are more gradual. Um, a depression, all right? So sometimes, depending on where you are, there will be depressions. They try to indicate depressions with these uh, tick marks. And you can see here, he's trying to help you memorize it with your hand. Um, and they'll show where it can just be an immediate drop off or cliff or a big hole that you would not necessarily want to navigate unless that was part of where you were trying to go. In this case, it looks like there's some marsh and stuff. Um, spurs, okay? So spurs, and anytime you're dealing with a mountain face, you're going to have rocks and terrain and stuff that are elevating out of the mountain side. And then you are also going to have dips in the mountain side, um, which are called draws, and we'll go over that in a second. But the ones that protrude out are called spurs. And you have to think that this might play into effect. So in this case here, this is this is a draw. You can see it's there's an elevation change. So this is water rushing down the side of this mountain right here. Again, these these are very tight uh, contour lines. So I would and too, you're probably going to get wet. Um, here is a good gradual change. Even though there's a little bit change here, you can see how gradual these get. Um, and the reason why we're also wanting to learn this is not just about land navigation of how to walk it. You would want to be able to look at this picture and identify that is a spur, that is a draw, that is a spur, that is a draw. Well, this is where I'm trying to get. And I can see, you know, the hilltop here. Okay, here's the hilltop here. Uh, that's what it's telling you. When you're trying to terrain associate, you should be able to see this spur on the side of the mountain. That's the point of learning these relief features. Draws I just mentioned. They're the opposite of a spur, where all these right here, are sp this is spurs on both sides, this is a draw. Sometimes you'll have to cross draws, sometimes you might actually have to get in a draw and navigate through it. In this case here, um, you can see that there's two uh, hilltops and they're trying to 
you know you if you had to get through this this is a saddle so they all they all eventually start touching each other you have um, a hilltop you have a saddle and a ridge line in between the two and then you have a draw that's going up to that saddle and then you have spurs now cliff cliff is a immediate drop and you can see how these contour lines are converging on one another to show a cliff uh, normally they will have tick marks that you can see uh, that will show indicate that now there's also cuts and fills so in this case with a uh, um, railroad track there is a cut coming through and then there is a fill where they built it up so in this case on the track when they're facing each other when a cut is facing each other and fields are facing outwardly um, and too again not that you would navigate over this but this might be something that you need to find on a map if you can get to this location say you're say you're struggling you're somewhere out here you don't know where it's at the water's all dried up but they're telling you there's a railroad track and they're telling you that there's a cut up here <clears throat> if you can get right here to this location and identify that cut now you have a very strong idea of where you are on the map uh, and we'll get over that uh, about backstops and planning routes and how to check yourself. So here's a full breakdown of everything that we just went over. Was hills, number one, you see these hills. Uh, two, being valleys. So down here are the valleys and these waterways and stuff where everything just comes to the bottom before it starts going back up the other side. Uh, we have ridges, right? Here's our ridges of where we are. Um, we could walk this and pretty much be on the top of the hill before we get to the very top. We have saddles that go in between two types of hills. Uh, we have depressions. Remember I said you would see indicators of tick marks on that. We have our draws, right? Right? Those are the, the, the valleys that start vertically going up mountain sides. We have our draws, right? Those, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, our spurs, that's what's jettisoning out. That might be good for land navigation. Uh, we also had our, our cliffs right over here. They're indicating that that's a cliff because these two contour lines are touching each other. So if you were over here trying to get up to this point, you would not want to come hit this cliff. Now, it might be good to know where the cliff is at and see it, and then you could work your way around here and work your way up and know what mountain that you're on. Uh, we talked about cuts, right? That cuts would be facing inwardly to each other, and then you would also have a feel where they're facing outwardly. So going back into declination, uh, so you need a way of expressing direction that is accurate, uh, is adaptable to any part of the world, and has common unit of measure. The common reference point for maps is true north, and map direction is figured in degrees from that point. Um, azimuths, the direction from one point to another point, is called an azimuth. Uh, I know you've heard me say that. Azimuths are given in degrees in a clockwise direction. Since there are 360 in a circle, an azimuth can be a number up to 360. So east is 90, right? We got 80 and 100, so that's 90. South is 180, 180 right there. 270, so here's 260 and 280. Right there west is 270. And then back up to north, we're at 360. Maps are laid out with a top towards the top of the earth, the true north. Many north and south lines on a map are given in grid north, which we discussed. And then the map needle points to magnetic north, like we had discussed before. Uh, neither points straight at the North Pole that is called True North. With compass and map, you can know the direction you are heading. So, let's get hot and heavy. If you need to pause it, you can pause it, and then I'll be waiting on you right here to get back into this. So, again, True North is North Pole. Magnetic North is how your compass is behaving where you are in the world. Grid North is how the map was established by the UTM uh, grid by the military and rescue teams. Uh, GNM angle, so the angular difference between Grid North and Magnetic North is called your GNM angle. The uh, reason why we need to know this is using a map, the ground compass, compass we often forget that the ground is important. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, using a map, the ground, and a compass. Uh, you cannot follow a grid north with a compass, nor can you plot a magnetic north with a protractor. To assist you in making this, you need to convert magnetic north back into grid north and vice versa multiple times. When using a map, using a protractor that we'll see in the next slides to measure a grid bearing, uh, do not use the compass magnetic needle. 
When using the ground, use a compass to measure magnetic bearings. So with grid north and the GMN angle, you find magnetic north. With magnetic north and the GMN angle, you find grid north. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in this case right here, we have true north. Magnetic north is 14 degrees off of it to the west and grid north is 10 degrees off from the the east so that map if you line up those grid squares um, that is that is what is indicated on the map that that is grid north 10 degrees off of true north and then your magnetic north is 14 so in this case you're going to add these two together the declination here is 24 degrees off so if you accidentally were looking at a grid and you pulled an azimuth off of it, let's just say, um, you know, two, 278 or whatever, and you pop a line with your uh, compass and try to walk an azimuth of 278, and let's say you just walk a thousand meters, you're going to walk 24 degrees off of what you thought you were actually walking. That, and that, again, that goes back into where you can make some heavy mistakes and get kind of lost on it now where the math comes into it so they try to make it where it's memorable so think left to right is subtract right to left is add a good way to remember that west to east is least east and least rhyme so you would subtract east to west is best west and best rhyme so you would add here so west to east is least you subtract east to west is best to add so here we have when the magnetic north is west or left of the grid north so using what we got let's say we were using our compass and we saw uh, we shot an azimuth we saw a hilltop that we wanted to make it to and we got that azimuth reading we want to convert it now into grid north to populate that on our map because we're going west to east we're going to subtract if it was vice versa and we pulled a grid let's say we pulled a grid uh, I'm, I'm sorry an azimuth off of a map at you know at 13 degrees and now we want to shoot an azimuth of that to make sure we're walking in reference to the grid north we would go east to west so we're going to add so I would take that 13 degrees and I would add 24 degrees or whatever my declination is and that is my new azimuth that I'm going to use with my compass to start walking forward same thing in this situation magnetic north is still west of it same thing if I'm going west to east I'm subtract if I'm going east to west I add um, here magnetic north is actually east of everything it's the same thing if I'm going grid to magnetic so I'm going west to east I subtract and if I'm going um, grid I'm sorry and if I'm going magnetic north to grid north in this case is going to be east to west and I'm going to add hopefully that makes sense we're going to study a little bit more but if you can remember anything from this slide west to east is least east to west is best all right, so here in this case, uh, we're going to put it to use. We're going to make it work. Um, so from ground to map, so that's taking the ground and using a compass to get an azimuth check. That's what that means. From ground to map, um, we have indicated here on the right that there is a 24-degree declination between uh, magnetic north and grid north. So we are on the ground. We shoot an azimuth at a tree, and we are wanting to walk that direction um, we come up with 49 degrees off of our compass and that is our magnetic north. We understand that our GNM angle is 24 degrees and because using our uh, our indicator here we are going from magnetic north to grid north so that is west to east and what is that? That means subtract. Um, west to east subtract. Um, that would be 49 of magnetic north minus minus because we're going west to east of the 24 degree GNM angle so now when we go to our map and we have where we believe that we are when we do a 25 degree grid grid measurement so we off of our grid north we go over 25 degrees that should be where that tree is on that map 
that is how you do ground to map. Now, let's do map to ground. Let's say we are trying to get to a hilltop that we cannot see, but there is a hilltop that we are trying to work for, and it ends up being right at 25 degrees on our map. We're able to pull that and see that. We we know that our GMM angle is 24 percent, uh, 24 degrees. So now we are going from grid north, magnetic north. So we are going from east to west, which we're going to add. So we would take four, uh, 25 plus 24 and get 49 degrees. Now I'm going to pull my uh, compass out. I'm going to shoot an azimuth and I'm going to go over until I get it at 49 degrees. And if I head in that direction, I'm going to hit that hilltop. That is how it works. And hopefully that makes sense. I believe there is another example here where, uh, you can see here um, the difference is only 9 degrees. The GMN angle is only 9. Um, so here from ground to map, you measure the bearing of a landmark on the ground uh, with a compass at 322 magnetic north. We know that the GNM, GNM angle is 9 degrees and we are working with magnetic north to grid north. So in this case, we're going east to west, which is best. So we're going to add 322 plus 9 gives us 331. That is what we would draw on our map if we were trying to point that azimuth out on our map. Map to ground, same case. We are we see a landmark on the map that we're trying to get to. We pull an azimuth check on that. It comes to 331. We are going to subtract the 9 degrees from it and get 322. So now when we use our compass, I'm going to walk a 332 azimuth to get to that landmark. <clears throat> All right, protractors. Uh, you can buy these on Amazon. I will put it in the link of the description if you want to purchase one. Um, but this is something that is so crucial into working uh, with a topographical map. It's used to calculate direction for map to ground and by converting the protractor grid north to magnetic north for a compass. It's also used in plotting azimuths, plotting position, and plotting UTM coordinates. And just to take note here, if you have M&N lines drawn on the, the map, you can align the protractor to a, a magnetic line and get the magnetic azimuth on the protractor, and you do not need to do any more conversions. And that is in part two, intermediate land navigation, that we'll get into, but I just want you to understand this right now, and then I'll teach what that, that's meaning in a little bit. Um, but basically, it's it's taking out the math that we were just doing and that you can just continuously do that uh, with the protractor. Um, here you can see that this inner circle right here, or inner square, uh, that is your uh, degrees. So just like a compass, that's 360. Out here is going to be all your mils, which we're not going to worry about. And then you have these different scales, right? So one in 50 thousandths, that is what the U.S. military uses. Uh, what this does is this is perfectly measured to fit on a 1 to 50,000 square uh, scale map that every thousand meters is going to be a grid square. So when you line this up on a map, you're going to see um, 1,000, 1,000, you're going to see a line, a line, a line, and a line. That's a grid square. Here is um, another scale, and then here's another scale that is just a little bit smaller. So in this case here, um, you're in thick woods, cannot see any landmarks, but you decide you want to go to Hill A. So you're in these, can't see where you're going, but all of a sudden there's Hill A that you need to get to. With a protractor, you're going to align the grid line. So you're, here's a grid line on a map. You're going to align it to the best you can, just kind of eyeball it. Uh, sometimes you'll get lucky and be able to point it right at the thing, but you're wanting to align it. And you're going to put the center of the protractor in this crosshairs where you think you are, where you believe to be. Um, now I will tell you in the Army something that we have done in the past is 550 cord or a lot of people know as paracord. It has a core to it so if you cut it uh, you get those little white um, uh, rope inside of it, that core. You can get one of those and you can take your knife and you just dig a hole with your knife into this tiny hole, just just enough that that uh, rope can fit through it, into the center of your protractor, and then you tie a knot on it so that string will not come out. And then you want the string to be the distance of where, how far you really would plan a walk. Um, you don't want it to be too short. 
Uh, and the reason why we do that is here, you're trying to see what this is. You're trying to get an idea of what this, um, this azimuth is to A. So with that string, let's just pretend the sh our string or our rope is this blue line. You would be able to take that rope and just hold it and point it right here against um, A, and that line would pull tight from where you are to A, and you would have a perfect lineup of showing that you're, you know, you're like 29 degrees on the map of what you're needing to walk. You don't have to do it. You can get a piece of paper and just put it there and run it there. But paper can get wet. Um, you know, trying to keep up with another tool to go along with this. We realized in the military, just having that piece of rope is real good, and it just needs to be a few inches past. Uh, the protractor, but enough that, you know, however far you think you're walking, that there's ample enough uh, rope or uh, string. So, sorry, didn't mean to break away from that, but that was just key to put that technique out. Uh, you see that the azimuth is 29 degrees. Convert this to magnetic azimuth and put this in your compass. So here we would get uh, 29 degrees. We would look at what our GNM angle is, if we have to add or subtract, and now we can pull our compass out and start uh, navigating to that with our magnetic north azimuth that we're going to get by drawing this out. Uh, here you can just see where they're breaking it down a little bit closer to the 29. All right, orienting the map with landscape. Um, magnetic north and true north. Uh, technique one, true north. Identify several landmarks on the map on the terrain. Visually orient, orient the map landmarks with the terrain landmarks and the map is oriented. So here in this case, he could definitely see that that was a hilltop. That was a hilltop. Um, he just kind of turned his map and said, you know what, that is where north is and now I've oriented my map that I can start working with it. Another technique is magnetic north. So here he is taking the compass and lining it up against the uh, magnetic north um, declination uh, line. And he's just rotating his map until the magnetic north needle meets the index line on the compass. And now your map is oriented. However you want to do it. I feel like this is a little bit more accurate, uh, especially if it's hard to eyeball any key features. So two techniques. Technique three here is find the magnetic declination value. Uh, in this example, it was 11.5. Place a compass at the edge of the map and uh, north and south line with the front compass facing up. Rotate the map and compass together uh, until it is at 11.5. Um, so all they've done is they're, they're getting the grid north here. This is grid north and you're converting it. Um, into uh, the declination change and again you're you're orienting this to true north okay you're making it true north um, another technique is when your position on the map is known so if you know where you're at uh, you can select a train feature on the ground then you can find on the map example as a hill with the compass, sight the azimuth to the hill. So in this case, it's 295 that he's pulling from that hill. Uh, from your position, align the compass edge through the hill and to your position, rotate the map and compass until you get to 295. Um, so that's another way to do it. Just different techniques. One and two is the best to use though. Uh, distance, relationship between the map and ground distance uh, is a function of a bar scale. The bar scale looks like a small ruler and usually has three to four bar scales, feet, miles, meters. That's what's down at the bottom middle of a map. Uh, ability to determine distance on a map as well as Earth's surface is an important factor. So depending on whatever the scale is. Example, one twenty-five thousandths means one unit of measure on the map is equal to 25 units of the same measure on the ground. So in this case, one inch is 25,000 inches. One centimeter is 25,000 centimeters. Same thing in the scale of one to 100 thousandths. One inch is 100,000 inches. One centimeter is 100,000 centimeters, and so on. All right, <clears throat> so example of a map scale of one and 25 means that one unit of measure on the map is equal to 25,000 uh, units of measure, which we just discussed that. Um, so you can see here, 10 centimeters at 25 thousandths is 250,000 centimeters. 3.9 inches at 25,000 is 97.5, so about 1.5 miles if you want to break down inches to miles. Um, position, 
Finds one's position on the map is the usual sense, such as an intersection of two compass bearings. Um, it is possible to locate your position on a map without a compass by land feature and map association, which is true. You can get a general idea. It is impossible to be totally lost. Finding your location is a process of narrowing down options. You can determine a point on the map by determining the lay of the land, finding prominent features, then relating them to your map. The narrowing down process will not take long. So uh, landmarks can be anything that you recognize on a map, hilltops, two roads that can at an intersection, a building such as a power grid substation, uh, you know, if you find that substation, you know exactly where you're at on the map. Uh, there's a second dimension to establishing position, which does depend on map reading skills. This is vertical dimension. On a map, it's referred to as relief. We talked about that, elevation changes. Knowledge of the relief of an area is extremely important in wilderness navigation. The most graphic technique ever devised to show relief information is that contour line that we talked about. If you were to walk a contour line, you would never go down, you would never go up. Navigation is not about finding yourself after you are lost, although that happens sometimes. Navigation is about keeping track of your position as you move away from a known point. That's a good definition. As you move, you have the re to remain cognizant of the terrain you are leaving, of the terrain you are passing, and of the terrain you are coming up on. So identification of s significant features, man-made or natural, partly a matter of knowing the language of maps. One category of map language is lines we talked about, uh, but also contour lines, uh, roads, trails, railroads, power lines. Another category is various picture symbols, and the third can be color. Um, so just looking at this, we can see, you know, general uh, gentle slope versus real steep slopes. Uh, this peak right here, so this is 500. We know that that peak is 576 feet or meters um, from uh, that 500, depending on what the contour line breakdown is, but this should be in feet. Uh, a river may be drawn somewhat with a straight, what straight on a map, but the terrain's actual river uh, meanders with curves and turns and wide and narrow banks. A topographical map shows the accurate as possible, but it can give you a false sense of what you might mentally think what is ahead of you and actually what is shown on an aerial photo or map. And sometimes they can be a little bit wrong. Uh, contour lines on a map do not show everything, so just be mindful of that. Right here, we would be walking this contour line and not necessarily know about this, which they're trying to indicate it here, but, uh, you know, there could be issues and stuff that you might need to think of. And two, you, you got to have some confidence. If I can tell you anything about land navigation, you got to have confidence in yourself. You have to. Because you could come up to this and think like, oh, I messed up on my pace count. I messed up in some form. And you would re -correct, you would uh, correct yourself and try to go do something else. You might actually see this cliff somewhere else on the map and be like, okay, maybe this is where I'm at. And you're not. You're actually where you thought you were. This is just something that's not on the map. I I've had situations of doing land nav back in the military when uh, – I would walk, you know, 800, 1,000, 1,200 meters and be confident that my pace count was pretty solid and I would hit a road. And I was short. I was about 700, 800 meters in of my 1,200 meter walk and I came up on a road that I knew I could not have already came up on that road yet. So I did an azimuth check and what that means is I shot down the road uh, with my compass and got an azimuth for what that road was and then I did my um, GNM angle change over to my map and, for, and got what that azimuth was and it matched. So I'm like, okay, this road is perfectly in line with the right azimuth as it should be that the road that I thought I was on but I still thought that it was it came way sooner than it should have well I looked to the east and I saw that there was a 90 degree bend on the road about 200 meters from me so I took off down the road went the 200 meters and I came up and there was no uh, right angle it was just it continued going on straight and I figured out that that was a new road that did not exist on my map. So I went back 200 meters to my location that I started. I kept going the um, 
the 400 meters more than I needed to and I hit it I hit the road and it was actually the road that I was supposed to be on now that point was a turning point for me I was actually supposed to turn and head in a new azimuth if I would have started back at that 800 meter road that I hit I would have been totally messed up on where I thought I was going but again I was having confidence in myself and the more you practice this the more confidence you can have and we're getting near the end guys so just hang in there um, a topographical map versus an aero photo map an actual land feature show this is just kind of showing uh, you know what is on the map of a topographical map versus land and an aerial photo sometimes there's stuff there that you might not see on a topographical map um, here's just showing the same thing trying to break down this lake of what it would be on the map and actually what it looks like in real life same thing looking at this depression but you can see here you know you got this uh, island there's the island um, you can see this here's this you can see the gradualness of uh, the contour lines you see how gradual this is throughout here you see the river I mean the um, another like stream or um, little pond right here that the rivers causing you can see that you can see all the steepness you can see that's 6,000 that's 606 uh, 60 6,685 you can see that's what all that is and again if you had to uh, get up here let's say you had to actually walk this um, you know you from this map you're somewhere in this area right here you might want to stay where you're at on the height of the con and just follow a contour line all the way around get up here and follow this ridge line on up maybe walk this spot right here because it's gradual it's way less steep as this is walk on up here and then you're at that peak um, you know and, and that this is terrain association you would just terrain associate and uh, maneuver over there to get to that peak um, all right so compare the next five slides with this map to get a viewpoint of perspective okay so we're gonna be using this map to get a viewpoint of uh, some different things all right so uh, Right here, you got Lake Powell, Tarn, um, you got Border Colorado, Grand Colorado, Mount Alice. So they're trying to say, where do we think that we are in, in reference to this? So I'm facing this way. I can see Mount Alice. I can see a Lake Powell, and then I can see Tarn. So I'm going to come back here. I see Lake Powell. I see the Grand Colorado and the Divide right here. Um, and then I'm also going to look for... Uh, Mount Alice um, on this so here this is a heavy peak right so there's and then here is this right here Mount Alice so they're saying this viewpoint is this which I would agree with there's this pond that we just saw Lake Powell and then off in the distance is Mount Alice and you can see it right here so that's where we're standing is we're here looking straight south we can see Lake Powell we can see Mount Alice now let's go over to picture two so now we can see Powell Peak McHenry Notch McHenry Peak and then Stone Man Pass and then we see the breakdown of border uh, Boulder County and then Grand County we'll back up to this picture and we'll go ahead I mean I'll go ahead and tell you it, it's right here that you're able to see Powell Peak Henry Notch, Henry Peak, and then Stoneman Pass, and then you see um, the borderline right here of the two counties wrapping around. And that's just terrain association. You can look at these heavy things and be able to see, yeah, this is this is where I'm at on the map, I can tell. Um, and this is just the breakdown of where they, they flipped the map for us, and we were able to see Lake Powell, and then able to see Mount Alice right there. And the same thing here, flipping it back over, and you're able to identify all these peaks and ridges. Map folding, just real quick, and then we'll be finishing this up. Uh, you should be able to fold it to make it small enough to be carried. You never, ever, ever want to lose your map. Don't ever lose your map. Figure that out. Uh, we always tied it to ourselves with 550 cord, so I had at times where it'd come out of my pocket and be dragging behind me, but you know what? I didn't lose my map. I'd always have my compass tied to me. I never lost my compass. Um, same thing with headlamps and stuff. If you're working at night, you want to um, 
have it. Another thing too is getting a carrier, like in this case, or laminating it. Uh, you don't want it to get wet. So if you can laminate it or get it in a waterproof carrier, do that, do that, do that. Um, after it's been folded here, they're saying place in a protection, uh, like a, just like I was saying, um, in some kind of um, protector. It's hard to navigate accurately with a dirty, grimy, wet, or damaged map. Take care of your map. It will take care of you. Most maps are printed on paper and require protection from water, mud, and weather, and tearing. Um, marking a map, it's necessary. If necessary to mark a map, use slight, uh, light lines so they can be erased without smearing or smudging. What we would do is use um, uh, permanent markers, which can come off with just rubbing really hard on laminate, or you can have some type of alcohol wipe or something. But you can make little marks everywhere and then be able to um, plan that out. Here's some pictures of map folding that they were doing. Uh, but you don't want it crinkled. Um, you want to be able to fold it where you can use the area that you're working with. Um, and that's pretty much it. They're out here. They would have you do a written exam and hands-on. Um, I know this is not fully showing you how to do a protractor heavily. Uh, I'm going to do a video where we're going to go outside and actually do some mapping out. And I'll have the map. Uh, up and we will do a protractor and everything and we're gonna plan out a route that we want to take and I'll show you more of how to use that protractor and how to use the map but this is just uh, down and dirty being able to show you um, land navigation on how to read a topographical map you got to be able to read it you got to be able to read it before you do any kind of navigation you got to do it before you start planning routes and stuff you have to know how to read this thing um, you have to be able to terrain associate. You have to know how to pull azimuths out of this from grid north to magnetic north, from magnetic north back into grid north. You need to know your GNM angle that you get from um, you know the uh, declination chart that's down at the lower right. I mean left. Um, you know, uh, in a little bit we'll be going over grids of the MGRS, the military grid reference system. Um, so hopefully this helps. There are more videos to follow. Um, so I appreciate your time and SF Actual out.